Hey there, this is Matt once again. Welcome back to another review. This is thanks to Jonathan Lindsay, who sent me a very nice gift. It was on my Amazon wish list. Uh, sent me this in the mail. Urban Legend, the collector's edition from Stream Factory. This is the new cover they have, the killer with the axe. And then this is the theatrical poster. <clears throat> now, of course, this is a film that was made because of the success of Stream. Now, I reviewed all four Stream films. I like the first one and the third one. Don't really care much for the second or the fourth one. But again, all four of those are reviewed on this channel. I know what you did last summer. I thought it was okay for what it is. I don't mind it. Uh, the sequel is a piece of shit. So much of kicking my fucking stand just thinking of it. You had fucking Jack Black with dreadlocks and talking as if he's fucking Jamaican or whatever the fuck that was about. Jeffrey Combs wasted in a cameo. I still know what you did last summer, piece of shit. Even the title doesn't make any fucking sense when you think about it for five seconds. And then the third one, I'll always know what you did last summer. It's like the killer from the first film is now an undead zombie. And like, what the fuck? You have movies like Valentine, which came out after this, and from the same director of this, although this is, I think, a much better movie than Valentine. I think I ranted on that, but it got taken down because of copyright, but that's a fucking horrible movie. Valentine is... The fucking Campbell Soup Kid is a killer. He does. He looks like the... I know it's a Cupid, but he looks like the Campbell Soup Kid. But I would say one of the better ones in that area, in that arena of slasher films and that timeline... Was this flick? This came out in 1998, so it was 20 years ago. Although I would put, say, Halloween H2O, I would put that above this for the third act alone, disregarding the bullshit of Halloween Resurrection. If I disregard that and think of it as its own movie, its own universe, that whole finale of Jamie Lee Curtis versus Michael Myers is better than. You know, I put it above this, but I still like this movie. And this will be a review of the movie and the Blu ray. Now, the movie, like I said, is directed by Jamie Blames, who is an Australian guy, his first time directing the film. After this, the stuff he directed wasn't much. Valentine was a piece of shit. He directed a couple little films that went straight to video. It's pretty much... It's just not much after that. I don't think he's directed a film maybe in ten years. The cast, you have Jared Leto. Of course, he was Joker in Suicide Squad. He's been in quite a few other films. Joshua Jackson, who at the time was on Dawson's Creek. You have Tara Reid, who's found success with the Sharknado movies. I think that was her. I barely remember those fucking movies. Alicia Witt is our lead. Loretta Devine, who is the security female security guard who is a fan of Pam Greer movies. Robert England makes an appearance as a professor. Brad Dourif has a small role in the first 10 minutes or so of the movie as a gas station attendant. Daniel Harris from Halloween 4 and 5, she's in this as the roommate of the lead who is a goth girl. She has a couple scenes including a sex scene which now you don't see much. You get the brief gist of it. And you also have Michael Rosenbaum. Michael Rosenbaum is a guy I've really begun liking as of recent months because there's this podcast I watch on YouTube called Tiger Belly, hosted by Bobby Lee, who is on Mad TV. I didn't grow up much with Mad TV, but I remember him from the Harold and Kumar movies, which I'm a fan of those. And oh, there's that guy. Very fun podcast, Tiger Belly. And a few times he's had on Michael Rosenbaum because they're friends. And Michael Rosenbaum, he was Lex Luthor on the Smallville TV show, which I didn't grow up with. But I've seen bits and pieces. Like, oh, okay, I know I recognize him from. But he's a very funny guy. He was very funny on that podcast. The special features on here, he is very, very funny. And I guess I think he has a podcast of his own, which I want to listen to sometime. I know he's friends with James Gunn. 
I think he was in Guardians of the Galaxy 2, but he was in makeup or or it was CGI over him. I forget which character. He's in this as the sort of the jokester of the group, I guess is the best way to say. Tara Reed is she's a radio host, but she's with Michael Rosenbaum. Pretty much right there. And you have this killer going around killing people using urban legends, which I like that idea. I like the concept. That's one of the reasons why I do enjoy the film. I think the concept is a fun idea. You know, calling someone, did you hear the, about the legend, the old woman that put a, tried to dry her dog in the microwave, and Michael Rosebaum opens the microwave and there's remains of this dog, which you can see... It goes by fairly quick, but you just see you know some blood and chunks in the microwave. There's a scene sequence at the beginning, you know, check the back seat of your car. The professor Robert England tells he teaches a class about urban legends and talks about the pop rocks and soda. Apparently, if the urban legend you mix them together, your stomach and the intestines will explode. But that's not the case. Because they're like, Mighty from the life serial, Mighty. Mighty likes it. He died. And it's like, no, he didn't die. He's still there. And I thought it was an interesting and intriguing concept. The killer. Granted, it's a bit weird. I mean, it, I don't mind that look for a killer. It doesn't make sense in this setup because it's very warm weather and no one's wearing this except one one of the drawbacks of the film is a couple dumb scenes like there's this character in a swimming pool and someone in this coat walks up looks like the exact same coat unzips you think they're pulling out an axe but no they're just taking the coat off and it's another like beautiful woman and it's like a cheap skate scare as I, even on the commentary, they admit that doesn't work. There's also a bit too many cheap jump scares, which just do not work. They're more annoying than anything. So I'm not going to say this is a great, you know, perfect slasher film. The other drawback, I wish we could see more blood, more gore, but the director purposely wanted to have you have them off camera to be quote exterior because the whole notion where you don't see a exterior but the thing is you only do that if you can really pull it off and very few films can pull it off I would say The Exorcist 3 that one scene in the hospital was that very long shot and you don't see the head cut off but you know you know what I mean if you've seen Exorcist 3. Like that's something like that works. But I like the concept. It's a good looking film. For his first time director has really wonderful cinematography. Uh, the transfer on this looks beautiful. The sequences of the rain and the nighttime. Uh, they, they definitely had a budget on this. The very. I don't want to say glossy, it's very, it doesn't look cheap, it doesn't look like direct-to-video quality, like a lot, a lot of films do nowadays, well, some films do. And also the director has a good tendency of using the camera, there's really wonderful camera movements, uh, when P Michael Rosenbaum's death scene when he dies the camera's up above and it turns as it goes up the camera will pan from over here to the driver's side or will pan up or a push in or you're inside the microwave when the remains are found of this dog and this pull out we're inside the microwave and the camera pulls out to our one of our characters so really solid pieces of camera work uh, I do think it's a well-directed movie.
unlike Valentine. Well, the plot, the Campbell Soup Kid looking motherfucker, I know what Cupid, but I'm, I know I'm repeating myself, but he does look like the fucking Campbell Soup Kid. And actually, before I forget, I was talking about the look of this. The reason they have this look is originally in the script, it was supposed to be snowing, supposed to be set in the snow, and ice storms, which would make this more legit of a look. This is like something that would be in the theme, you know, in that movie. In fact, it is. I mean, look at that outfit up there, and then look at this. I mean, that's like the outfit that the fucking film should be set in Alaska or something. <laughs> you know, a slasher film in Alaska. Why don't they do that? They kind of tried without film white out. That was a piece of shit. But anyway, that was the reason, but they couldn't shoot it. And they probably should have just gotten a different look for the killer. I mean, I, I don't mind it, but it's rather lazy when you think about it. It's just a winter coat. I know I'm down there on the foot, but because I don't want to appear as if this is one of the ten best slasher films. I like the cast. Alicia Witt, I thought, did fine in the lead. I don't mind Jared Leto as an actor. I don't mind Joshua Jackson. I like Michael Rosenbaum. It was cool to see Brad Dourif and Robert Englund and Daniel Harris in there. I thought those were fun, supporting, familiar faces. The score was fine by Christopher Young. It felt the film fine. It's not one of his best scores. And again, there's some good direction. The setup at the beginning where you have this character. I think she's the daughter of Natalie Wood. I could be wrong on that, but I believe she is. And maybe the movie's trying to make us think she's going to be the lead. And Brad Dourif, who is this guy? And he's like, he stutters. And he's like, there's someone in the back seat. He finally gets out, but it's too late. And like the murder where the ass goes for her head. And it cuts and the ass goes out. The ass cr crushes. Crushes. Goes through the window. It's stylish. You know, little bits of that I thought I had some nice little bit of style to it. Loretta Devine, I know some people, her character got on their nerves. I didn't mind her. I thought she was a fun little character. Again, I don't mind the cast, other than Tara Reid. I'm not much of a Tara Reid fan. I don't think she's that good of an actress. I've never thought she was that good of an actress. I, I think she's the weak point of the cast. Rebecca Gayhart. She did fine as well. I, I keep using that word fine. And that's what I mean. It's, it's a decent fine movie. I don't think it's so bad that it deserves a 5.5 .5 on IMDb, but are there a couple flaws? Sure. But the concept, the story, the lead character has a little bit of moral compass, something that ha she was a part of in the past, so she has a little bit of guilt with that. There's some nice sequences. Like she thinks her roommate's having sex, so she doesn't wake her because she's been told before to not bother her. So she hears moaning, and she goes to bed. But really, the girl, Daniel Harris, is being killed. And then when she wakes up, there's blood on the walls. Aren't you glad you didn't turn the lights on? Uh, I thought that was a decent sequence. Death scenes like Michael Rosenbaum, where he gets dumped in the toilet, and then... This pop rocks and drain or pour down his throat. I thought that was a decent uh, death scene. I, uh, I think the actor's name is John Neville. I remember he was on the X Files show and he was in the X Files movie, Fight the F Future, which was the same year as this, 1998. The guy who plays the Dean. There's a sequence where a car, he gets cut in the back of his foot and I think the Achilles tendon I believe that's what it's called 
and he's crawling, and there's the spikes that will flatten your tire, and he gets pushed onto there by this car. So I do enjoy a couple of the death scenes. Uh, the movie went uh, at a pace that it didn't bother me. I didn't. I wasn't that bored with it. And again, I don't mind the characters in the film. I thought the acting was fine across the board, it's, except Tara Reid. Like I said, it was nice to see a couple familiar faces. Brad Dourif, Robert England, Daniel Harris. St good looking direction, cinematography. I mean, like I said, there are problems. It could use gore. I disagree with the director to not show gore. Definitely disagree with him on that. The, like I said, the outfit, it's a bit lazy. But he should have ponied up a couple more bucks to do the ice storm, the snow. I think that would have helped a little bit better with the surroundings. But overall, fun concept, decent slasher film, and good features. I mean, you have a new commentary with Jamie Blaine's producer Michael McDonald and assistant director Edgar Pablos. You have the old commentary, which I just listened to, which was a fun commentary with Jamie Blaine's Michael Rosenbaum and writer Silvio, Silvio Horta. I think this was done like three weeks after the film came out. That's pretty entertaining commentary. And you do have a dad reel, archival making of, never before seen behind the scenes footage, and quite a few featurettes. Now granted, this isn't the this wouldn't be the first movie that would choose to get tons of features. This wouldn't be the first slasher movie I would choose to get tons of features. April Fool's Day from 1986, but we all know why that doesn't get because Paramount or Parapricks. The Hitcher, which I know it's not really a slasher film, but and the, I have the DVD from overseas that does have features, but it deserves an upgrade. It deserves a Blu-ray. By just the rights to that is, I don't know what's going on with the rights to that, honestly. Split second. I know it's not slasher, but I'm just going off on other movies. My Bloody Valentine from 1981 could use another Blu-ray. Since the older Blu-ray is out of print. Did some more features. That's not sharing. Oh, half the features is about the remake. Which I didn't mind, but... Again, you watch the DVD and of My Bloody Valentine 1981. Half of that is about the remake. That deserves a more... That deserves a collector's edition. But I don't know who the fuck owns that. Is it Paramount again? I don't know. If it is, then we're fucked. It's Paramount doesn't do shit. So, there's tons of other movies, yes. But, since I am a fan of the film, it was nice to watch this stuff. You have the story behind Urban Legend, which is 9 minutes and 37 seconds. And I think the reason they got so many featurettes on here... It's because so many people actually wanted to talk about the film. That's not always the case. I mean, I understand at the end of the day, it's about who they can get. And they got a lot of people. They got people who ran the companies, like Phoenix Pictures. They got producers like Neil Moritz. Yeah, the guy who produces the Fast and Furious movies. He's on the interviews of this movie. You got a good chunk of the cast. Alicia Witt is interviewed, Loretta Devine, Rebecca Gayhart, Tara Reid, which she sounds fucking high on weed, Michael Rosenbaum, which his stuff is the funniest, most entertaining parts of it, Robert England gets interviewed, Daniel Harris gets interviewed, and yeah, good chunk of the cast, Christopher Young, who did the score, who I, I'm a fan of, I love his score down the street too. It's my favorite of the Elm Street scores. Uh, the Fly 2, Hellraiser, of course. The story did for Copycat is pretty good. But the story behind Urban Legend uh, is nine and a half minutes long. It deals with the writer and the producers 
the success of Scream, getting this film together, giving it the green right. No studio would pick it up. It went to Phoenix Pictures, which I guess was Phoenix Pictures' most successful film. Then you have Assembling the Team, which is 17 minutes and 44 seconds long. They, you interview, they interview director Jamie Blanks. They show a bit of his slasher home movies, which is ironic because they're gorier than this movie. Which is funny, he made these home movie slasher films that are very gory. But then when he makes a, once he makes a feature length film, he doesn't want to make a, a gory movie. I, I don't get that, but whatever. I guess Jamie Blaine's had wanted to do I Know What You Did Last Summer. And he actually made a fake trailer. I actually kind of wish they put the full trailer of that on this disc. But you see snippets of it. Like before the film was made, he wanted the job and they sent it in. And like the guy got it a day before they were set to shoot. So they couldn't hire him. But it's like, wow, this trailer looks pretty damn good. I'm guessing if he had done it like maybe a couple weeks before, he would have gotten the job. Uh, the production designer on this film is the guy who worked on Blade Runner and designed Decker's apartment and such. Uh, and how Jamie Blanks got the job for the directing chair. And I do think he did a good job directing the film. That's one of the you know, high points. Again, the, what he did with the camera, the, him working with the DP, the, the look of the film. It's a good looking film. A cast of legends, 18 minutes and 46 seconds long. Like I said, you got Alicia Witt, Rebecca Gayhart, Robert England, Michael Rosenbaum, who is very entertaining. He does his Christopher Walken impression, which is dead on. Like I said, Tara Reid, Loretta Devine, Daniel Harris. There's someone in the back seat, which is 15 minutes and 42 seconds long, which is a discussion about the first 10 or so minutes of the movie, making that. They interview the actress who stars in that sequence, who has scenes with Brad Dourif. I forget the actress's name. I, I, again, I think she's the daughter of Natalie Wood. I could be wrong on that, but definitely looks like her. If it is, it definitely looks like her mom. But they talk about how that whole sequence was filmed. Stories from the set, which is 28 minutes and 39 seconds long. Uh, Campus Carnage, 23 minutes and 30 seconds long. That's, you know, filming the, the death scenes. Uh, John Neville really hated filming his death scene, apparently, when he got impaled on the tire, what the hell, tire tracks. The stuff that cuts, fucks up your tires. Apparently, he's like, fuck y'all, I'm gone, or something after filming. So, I, I, from what I understand, they pissed the old guy off. But it seems like most people loved working on the film. They definitely have a passion. They just, everyone treat each other well. One's called a legendary composer. Interview with Christopher Young, who seems like a really good guy, based on his interviews. A lasting legacy, 17 minutes long. They talk about the test screening. They even show little bits of the test screening, the audience's reactions. And the film did well box office. And gr now granted... Even I'm like, okay, I like the film, but it's not a classic. It's not this lasting legacy of urban legend. To be honest, most people don't give a shit about urban legend. Most people don't give a shit about the 90s films of horror. Most people don't give a shit about those films that were inspired by Scream. It's like, okay, let's not live in a bubble. There's a lot of people who do not like those movies. I don't mind some of them. Like I said, I don't mind I know we did last summer. I like Stream. I like Stream 3. I do. I reviewed it. You want to know why? Watch your review. I do like this film, even with its flaws. But it's not a classic. But okay, you know, they, they're proud of the film. I can understand that. Uh, you have extended interviews, two parts. Each one's like almost 40 minutes long. And it's just extended interviews with some of the cast and crew. 
Michael Rosenbaum, he again, he was the best guy interviewed because he really seems like a horror film fan. And it was fun in the extended interviews. He talks about like horror films today. They're not really that scary. And how he he is a fan of horror films. And there's like a tiny bit where he almost goes off on he's getting tired of superhero movies and just people are like, oh, you're Lex Luthor. I bet you love superhero movies. He's like, eh, not really. You know, I'm a horror film fan. And then he would go to Fangoria. And, I mean, he would uh, read Fangoria. He would go to conventions. How he worked, uh, let's see. He would reference films like The Shining. Um, he brought up The Exorcist 3, which was pretty cool. I mean, he really does seem like a fan. And... It seems like a really cool guy, so I really enjoyed watching that stuff. And you know it's lengthy enough when they put the special features on a separate disc from the film. <laughs> so again, you did quite a few interviews with this, which was surprising. I wish they did it with all movies, good and bad. Because just make it equal. I mean, don't fucking have this movie only have 20 goddamn minutes. And a good chunk of that is just footage from the movie. I mean, I, I would say I prefer that getting the attention this film got. But yeah, I don't hate the movie. I do like the film. Like I said. I thought most of the cast did fine. I didn't mind their characters. I liked the premise and concept of the movie a lot. The movie went at a pace that didn't bother me. It's a good looking film. It's a well shot film. Nice usage of the camera. Getting some solid camera work going on. The score fit the film fine. It wasn't annoying. It wasn't obnoxious. The, the ending, you didn't need a sequel bait ending. You didn't need that. You find out, uh, spoiler, Rebecca Gayhart is the villain. Which was, was an interesting idea. Uh, I'll give you that. Again, I don't think you needed a sequel bait ending, but oh well. And even then, she only had a cameo in the second film, but she had really nothing to do with it, so it was kind of pointless them going that route. I would much rather her character just die at the end. That'd be such a finality. So watch it again. I do did find quite a couple issues with it. But overall, entertaining film. Above a time waster. Like I don't do star ratings. Okay, if I did star ratings, if it was a if it was out of four stars, there would be three stars. You know, one of those things, it'd be like, I liked it, I don't love it. It was nice to watch the interviews, though. A lot of interesting information to be found. Which is what you want in this kind of stuff. So, this is a damn, if you're a fan of the movie, this is a must, just to check out the, the interviews. One thing about the interviews, I don't understand why there's no play all option. Because even says a feature link documentary, I thought it was going to be all put together like the Critters. Like the Critters box set, the first one, it's like an hour and 11 minutes, and it's all in one go. Here, though, it's separated into each of those features I talked about, and there's no play all option. So you watch for 9 minutes, then you click on the next one. Watch that for 17 minutes, you click on the next one. I don't understand why it wasn't just put all together as one full documentary or why there wasn't a play all option. I don't get that. But yeah, you get TV spots, you get the trailer. Yeah, I don't know what more. You're not going to get Jared Leto. You're not going to get Joshua Jackson. Uh, Brad Dourif. There's not much of him to talk about. He just stuttered and... He did well in the job he was supposed to do, but just not much to say. But anyway, 
those are my thoughts, my rambling, my mumblings of Urban Legend, both the Collector's Edition and the movie. Like I said, if you're a fan of the film, the Collector's Edition is well worth it. It's packed to the deal with features, interesting interviews. Um, a good chunk of the people involved with the film. And yet, even like studio people, producers, the director, good chunk of the cast, uh, the DP, the production designer, Charles Breen. Who again, I think he worked on Blade Runner. The writer, Silvio Horta. I said Neil H. Moritz. I think all three producers, Gina Matthews. But I almost, that's how much of a good time they had making the film, is that everyone came back to do interviews. Which, or pretty much everyone. I wish all movies had that when they had play. Like, this is a collector's edition that makes sense. Like, it is a collector's edition. I understand why they put that on there. Sometimes it's like, this is a collector's edition? Really? No, this is a collector's edition. It's packed with features. And again, I want to stress, I don't repeat myself for the fifth time. I do like the film. Because sometimes I've just talked off the top of my head and it seems like I dislike the film more than I do. But like I said, I like the premise. I like the cast. Satori. Uh, the twist with Rebecca Gayhart was kind of interesting. A little bit different. Like I said, a little bit. Uh, the, the score was fine. I like Jared Leto. I like... Michael Rosenbaum, Alicia Witt, I thought she did fine. And stylish direction, nice bits of camera work, nice, good looking film. It shows up very well on Blu ray. Very solid picture transfer. Well directed movie. Just, you know, if you use door. The again, the alpha is a little bit lazy, and some of the other stuff I already talked about. So I'll stop here. This is 32 minutes long. Anyway, thanks for watching this video. Take care, and we'll see you guys later. Bye bye.